All right, well, it's great to see this many of you here this morning. I didn't actually expect it with the exam tonight, so kudos to all of you for showing up today. And uh, I've heard through the grapevine that some people are having difficulty locating the lecture notes that I've been posting. So be sure to look for those on BSpace, not on the Bio1B website. You should have received emails after each lecture with the link to the lecture notes. But if you didn't, you can go to the, the BSpace site, log in with your Cal ID, go to My Active Sites, the menu up on the upper left, right of the menu. And under there, you should find the link which says Bio1B Lecture Plants um, Fall 10. And then click there. And that'll take you to a screen where you'll see um, resources as one of the choices on the left. Click resources and you'll find the, the lecture folder and just open that up and all the lecture uh, presentations are in there with the notes embedded in. So please check that out. If you have trouble, just give me an email. Okay, also don't forget on Sunday night to change the clock back one hour or you'll show up an hour early for lecture, which I'm sure you'd rather not do because I certainly won't be here then. Um, okay, so I'm going to start out today just going back over, uh, actually continuing this survey of the algae and uh, looking at the last major form of life cycle. And it's actually the one we'll be looking at for the rest of the course. So it's really important to, in particular, focus on this one, which isn't common to all the algae, just some of them, but it's found in all the land plants. And then we'll get to some algal uses and then talk about the invasion of land by plants, which will be a theme into the next lecture as well. Okay, I just want to make one jump back to the fungi, though. This slide you might remember about penicillin. I just want to clarify what I was trying to get across here because it was a bit unclear the way I presented it. That uh, penicillin, really, the major point I was trying to make here is that the, the cell walls of bacteria are different from the cell walls of all eukaryotes, OK? They're comprised of peptidoglycans, which, as the name implies, are made up of, an amino, of amino acids and sugars. And um, penicillin acts to interfere with the enzymes the bacteria need to synthesize the peptidoglycans. And without their cell walls, the bacteria will burst and so it's very effective as a medicine because, of course, we lack cell walls. And fungi can get away with producing it because their cell walls, of course, are made of chitin, which is, um, I mentioned that a few times earlier, the same uh, carbohydrate that uh, arthropod exoskeletons are made of, or organisms like crustaceans and insects. So I just want to add that extra context here. I hope that is a little clearer now. All right, so as far as the algae go, just want to recap the main points so far before we launch back in. Oops. Oops, yeah, that's right. So um, remember that the cyanobacteria, the blue-green bacteria, these share the ability to photosynthesize, to use light to capture atmospheric carbon, fix it as sugar. And uh, they're the only organisms that have actually evolved photosynthesis. I shouldn't say the only ones, but the ones that evolved photosynthesis uh, that all the algae have uh, subsequently taken advantage of. So the evolution of photosynthesis by cyanobacteria represents the uh, sole evolutionary event that resulted in photosynthesis. And then all the other algal lineages basically just captured cyanobacteria, either directly or indirectly and have taken, uh, utilized their um, evolutionary innovation that way. And only one uh, major lineage of the cyanobacteria gave rise to all of the plastids, the chloroplasts, and other plastids in uh, the eukaryotic algae. OK, so that, that was. <laughs> um, as far as I know, yeah. That's, that's all I'm, I'm only familiar with, with uh, cyanobacteria. I mean, one of the things we're going to see, there's quite a few single events. And I mean, if we look back to uh, the land plants, they all seem to stem from one ancestor. 
photosynthesis seems to stem back to one lineage. But it's hard to say, you know, if there were evolution, if there were other um, trial balloons out there that just didn't succeed and they were outcompeted. Uh, it's difficult. I mean, well, there may have been more than one origin of life on Earth. As far as we can tell, there's just one lineage of life and all living organisms descend from that common ancestor, but there could have been a lot of different, um, you know, living or semi-living, whatever you want to call them, types of things out there that uh, couldn't compete with the organism that gave rise to, to life. Well, that all the photosynthetic eukaryotes have captured the uh, cyanobacteria uh, result from an event, this endosymbiotic event, where cyanobacteria were captured. And this basically, tr this tree encompasses all of the main lineages of eukaryotic uh, organisms that um, descend from that, that event. And that, that includes all of the photosynthetic organisms. The green algae, as I'll point out later, um, ultimately gave rise to land plants. So this is, this is pretty much it. So it really does look like one event that gave rise to, to all the photosynthetic organisms that uh, we call algae or land plants. So again, we had this major divergence between um, this first major split between eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, red algae on the one hand and green algae on the other. And we'll talk about those groups in a little more detail in a moment. But I, wanted to, I was starting out first talking about some of these other lineages that had originated from a secondary endosymbiosis or acquired their plastids, their chloroplasts, by secondary endosymbiosis where they uh, engulf a eukaryotic photosynthetic organism, either a green alga or a red alga. And um, this led to a number of lineages. I didn't have much to say about this one because it's pretty minor. But I did mention uh, there's a major lineage here, the euglenids, which captured their chloroplasts uh, by capturing a, a unicellular green eukaryotic algae. And they have a flagellum, which allows them to move around quickly, like you can see here. It's very distinctive. It has some crystalline inclusion in it that you can do a section of it. It's very distinctive. Um, their plastid is very much like a green alga, so that, that uh, in addition to the molecular data, make it really clear. But uh, most of them actually can still capture prey. They can still engulf prey. And so it's uh, even the, the, you can see that the potential for a secondary endosymbiosis, um, you know, to actually still engulf an organism that could be potentially become a symbiont is even still present in these organisms, even the ones that are photosynthetic in part, in many cases. Okay, and then the other main lineage, the ones, the secondary endosymbionts that captured red algae include these ones. And I mentioned last time the dinoflagellates, uh, which like the euglenids are major components of phytoplankton. And remember phytoplankton just means basically plankton, which are free floating organisms in aquatic situations, unicellular ones typically. Phyto means plant, so photosynthetic basically. So dinoflagellates, um, descend from a common ancestor with these other groups that had a, a, a red alga incorporated into their cells. And a good number of the dinoflagellates are still photosynthetic. Some of them have lost the ability to photosynthesize and strictly are heterotrophic and are actually pretty good uh, predators in some cases. But um, I showed you some photos of these uh, last time. And they have this external armor, these plates of cellulose. And cellulose, again, is the same carbohydrate that uh, we haven't gotten to this yet, but in plants, the cell walls, the land plants have cell walls of cellulose as well. But this appears to be an independent origin of that. Anyways, these have some interesting ecology, especially in oceanic situations that I mentioned last time with the red tides and toxins, bioluminescence. Um, the other really major group of photosynthetic organisms that descended from this uh, secondary endosymbiosis involving a red alga are what's called the stromenopiles. And that name's not so important, but it's basically a group that includes a huge diversity of different groups of organisms. 
uh, and several that are photosynthetic that we've long recognized as distinct groups. But now it's clear that they're all very closely related. Whoops. And one of these is the diatoms, which I just got to, or was just getting to at the end of the last lecture. And this is one of the most diverse groups of algae. There are over 100,000 species described. And remember, that's roughly the same diversity that we see across all of the fungal phyla. So that's a huge number of taxa. Um, you know, it's, it's roughly a third of what we've recognized among the flowering plants. So it's a huge amount of diversity. And you can see, get some sense of this diversity. It's really clear morphologically that you're dealing with lots of different groups of organisms here. And one of the reasons there's so many of them described, well, there are a couple of reasons. Well, one thing, they're incredibly abundant. You find them in huge numbers. If you just take a scoop of seawater or lake water in different aquatic settings or marine settings, you can find large numbers of diatoms typically and a lot of diversity. Um, but they also are morphologically differentiated oftentimes by their cell walls, which you can see are really extensively ornamented. And there are many different shapes and sizes of these things in terms of different taxa. And these cell walls are really amazing because they're actually largely made up of, of uh, hydrated silica, like glass. And they preserve really well then in the fossil record. They're inert. And we have an excellent fossil record of diatoms that goes way back. And um, paleobotanists that work in this group have lots of stories to tell from the fossil record, usually really rich and pretty complete records. Um, there's also extensive deposits of diatomaceous earth, it's called, that's really valuable. It's mined extensively where you find these deposits of diatom skeletons and used uh, for filtrate um, and a wide variety of purposes. But there's one really huge uh, deposit down in Santa Barbara County near Lompoc. If you're ever down in that area, they've been mining that uh, for many decades. And one of the most important things about diatoms is that they may account for up to 25% of the photosynthesis, the primary productivity that's going on on Earth. So they're pumping out a huge amount of oxygen. They're capturing a lot of CO2. And um, they're considered to be one of the crucial organisms for maintaining atmospheric CO2 at a reasonable level. So there have been proposals to actually try to increase the number of diatoms in the ocean by dumping large amounts of iron into the ocean. But uh, so far, that hasn't happened because these major types of ecosystem interventions like that sometimes have unforeseen consequences. And it's not quite clear what that might end up resulting in. Um, you know, the, the negative impact might outweigh the positive ones. But one of the things that diatoms do that's important in addition to fixing CO2 is that when they die, they tend to sink. And so they actually end up on the ocean floor. And by doing that, they take that carbon out of the ecosystem, essentially. And so that carbon's not recirculating back into the atmosphere. And um, so they can really store a lot of, they can take carbon out of the system, which would be a really valuable thing right now. Okay, and one of the str strangest things about these guys is that uh, these are unicellular typically. Sometimes they'll be in filaments, but they're separate cells, separate organisms. And as you can maybe make out here, not very well, they, uh, their cell wall is basically like two halves of a Petri dish with one half inside the other one. And so when they actually go to reproduce, it's pretty bizarre. But... Uh, well, I should mention, first of all, that they actually have an animal-like life cycle in terms of the, the type of, well, that the fact that there's only, the only haploid stage is the gametes. So they're just like us that way. The mature diatom is diploid, and they have, uh, uh, basically, fertilization happens right after meiosis, like it does with us. So that's an interesting difference from other groups. Um, they also um, reproduce by semi-conservative replication in a sense. It's almost like DNA replication in the sense that they're each half of their shell, they mostly asexually reproduce without sex, mostly. 
But when the eggs actually reproduce, the two halves of the shell separate, and uh, a new half for each one of those halves is created inside the old one. So if you're creating new shells inside the old half all the time, at least some of the lineages are going to get to be progressively smaller through time. And that decrease in size, of course, is going to reach a critical threshold at some point. And roughly around that time, these lineages are stimulated to start producing gametes, and they undergo sexual reproduction when they get too small. And they release their gametes. The two halves of the shell separate, release the gametes, which have been produced, of course, by meiosis, because they're diploid uh, adult organisms. The uh, gametes get together with those of other individuals, make a zygote, and then that develops into a new diploid, fully sized diatom. So that's uh, one of the really interesting things about diatom reproduction. Okay, so are there any questions about diatoms? Yeah. Well, a diatomaceous earth is used industrially for lots of different purposes. Um, it's an abrasive. It can be used as an abrasive. I mean, it is, you know, silica is involved. And uh, it's also, um, well, there's, yeah, it goes on and on, but it, it's used as a filtrate. The diatoms have, uh, you know, they're so tiny, and uh, there's some porosity to their skeletons, I mean, to their cell walls. So it's, yeah, there's a wide range of, of uses, but, but uh, yeah, it's harvested on a mass scale. I mean, it's mined on a, on a large scale for a, a number of different industrial uses. Okay, so the diatoms are just one group of straminopiles, that one clade I mentioned that has quite a few photosynthetic organisms in it. Another one are the golden algae, and these are also unicellular or colonial, but they're mostly in fresh water. Diatoms are either fresh or seawater. Um, but uh, they're called golden, I just want to mention, because they have this golden appearance because they have these, um, these accessory pigments in their plastids in addition to chlorophyll that are useful for capturing light at wavelengths that penetrate water well. And that's um, something that we also see in their close relatives, the brown algae, which are mostly marine. Almost all of them are found in the ocean. And they also have this uh, yellowish or brownish color from these accessory pigments. Well, it used to be thought that these were pretty closely related to land plants because they have pretty similar morphology and some of them have similar life cycles. But now we know that these are actually a completely distinct lineage of eukaryotes that have captured plastids. You know, they, they descend from a common ancestor with the diatoms, the goldens, and even the dinoflagellates that captured a red alga, that have an ancestor that captured a red alga. They don't descend from the green algal lineage. And this includes some of our really significant and uh, large kelps. We find these worldwide, but um, off our coast, we have some of the most, most spectacular members that uh, both in the intertidal region, up in the wave, the wave crashing zone, as well as out in deep water. So up in the intertidal zone, if you've been out along our coast, this north coast, in some of the roughest areas of the intertidal zone where the waves are constantly breaking against rocks, you might have seen these things look like little palm trees out there. Um, this is the sea palm, it's called, uh, Postelsia palmiformis, which is actually edible. I've eaten this. It's, it's pretty good. Um, but it's only harvested on a, low, on a mi minor scale. But it demonstrates first that uh, some of the features of kelps that look very much like that of land plants. First of all, look at this thing. It looks very tree-like. It has blades up here that are uh, highly packed with plastids where you get a lot of photosynthesis occurring. Um, they look very much like leaves of a flowering plant. That's convergent evolution. There's no close relationship. They also have a stem-like stipe or stalk here that uh, looks very stem-like, but that's completely convergent as well. And they have a hold fast that affixes them to the substrate, and that's also, uh, they look root-like, but that's not what that is. Um, it's, an, it's basically an attachment structure rather than a conducting structure. And uh, 
these things can withstand waves crashing against them that would tear any, or, any other upright organism apart. And various biomechanicists that have been interested in the, the way that organisms can survive in this zone where you have the waves crashing against them constantly can't really easily account for these guys because they break all the rules and um, they shouldn't be able to withstand these, these impacts. But one of the things that's important in this regard is that their cell walls are bathed in this gel-like uh, polysaccharide, so this kind of mucilaginous polysaccharide, which is found across the brown algae and also it will show later in the red algae as well, although it's different bi biochemically there. But these mucilaginous polysaccharides um, give this thing a, a lot of flexibility and strength. And uh, it's one of the more interesting intertidal organisms. But out at the other end of the spectrum, we get these kelps growing in water up to 200 feet deep. So in really deep water. Um, here you can see one of our coastal forests of kelp. And these are keystone organisms ecologically. They provide basically a forest-like environment out in the ocean that provides cover, um, you know, nursery ground, a feeding area for a wide variety of vertebrates and invertebrates. So these kelp forests we have off our coast are, um, you know, basically um, are, are, are fundamental elements of this unusual ecosystem we have here along our Pacific coast. And a lot of these big kelps that are out in deep water, they have floats uh, near their blades that serve to buoy their leaves or their blades up in the upper water layers where they're more in closer proximity to uh, where they have more availability to light. So they have a number of interesting adaptations that um, for a number of different kinds of environments. And they're a really diverse group, both on our coast and elsewhere. Okay, so those are the brown algae. So the red algae, um, you're, might, you're probably familiar with these too. They often wash up on the beach, just like the browns. And we can find them from the intertidal zone down into much deeper water than where we find the brown algae. These guys can get into water that's almost 1,000 feet deep and where light can barely penetrate. So that's, uh, these are really extraordinary in terms of their ecological range in the ocean. And we find the most diversity of these ones in the, tr in the tropical oceans, but they're also well represented along our coast and we have a lot of diversity. They have incredibly complex life cycles and I w we won't even attempt to try to teach you the life cycles of red algae because they have various stages. It's, uh, they're real brain teasers as far as trying to figure out how it all works. But um, there's bizarre things that happen. There's some br red algae that actually will parasitize uh, other red algae. Uh, they have strange uh, ecology. But as you get into deeper water, up in the shallow water, um, they tend to be uh, more greenish in coloration, like the nori that you're probably familiar with from sushi, uh, porphyra, which is harvested from shallow water and uh, is used to wrap sushi in Japanese cuisine. But you get out into deeper water and they tend to be more reddish. And um, that's there's a good reason for that reddishness. And that is that when you get out into deep water, here you can see the degree to which light penetrates in the ocean and uh, breaking it out by the different colors of light. And when you get down below about 125 meters in depth, you're pretty much just, ca you're just getting the penetration of blue and green light down here. And so this is, these are the wavelengths that these organisms can utilize when they're in the deeper water. Um, and so they tend to, 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 they have accessory pigments that appear red because they're reflecting red light. They're not absorbing red light, they're reflecting it. They're absorbing blues and greens. And uh, these are phycoerythrins, the name's not important, but there are accessory pigments in the plastids along with the chlorophyll and they're masking the chlorophyll color. Um, chlorophyll also has a, a high absorption in the blue end of the spectrum here, but also in the red part of the spectrum, as you can see here. Uh, the phycoerythrins are, uh, have their absorption of light up in this area, so they augment that 
and uh, lead to a lot more photosynthesis than would occur otherwise at those deeper depths. So that's what's going on with the red algae. Okay, so finally now the green algae, and we're going to basically be talking about green organisms for the rest of the course. Um, are there any questions about any of the other groups we just talked about? Okay, so the green algae uh, have a wide variety of different forms and ultrastructural uh, morphological variations. There's a lot of different uh, ecologic, there are a number of different life cycles among the green algae. It's a really diverse group. But these all seem to stem from that primary endosymbiosis that involved the capturing of the cyanobacterium. And they descend from a common ancestor with the red algae that also are uh, diverged from that common ancestor that had acquired its um, photosynthetic ability from that primary endosymbiosis. And they range from unicellular organisms like the Chlamydomonas, which is a model organism here. Um, you can see the two flagelli up at, at the uh, apex of its cells here. That's a SEM. It's actually green. It, and it's just the black and white. And here you can see a colonial um, green alga, Volvox. Uh, these Volvocalians are really cool. They move through the water as a big spherical colony and produce additional spherical daughter colonies inside. Um, the cells can live separately, but they can't reproduce separately. So these are real true colonial organisms. And then we have multicellular green algae like the sea lettuce here, uh, Ulva, uh, one of the seaweeds. So there are seaweeds among the green algae too. And they occur in both freshwater, I should say green algae occur in both freshwater and marine situations, different taxa. They also occur in high elevation snow fields. And if you've been hiking up in the high Sierra during the summertime and you find, uh, you see some snow field that looks red, that's not some sort of air pollution or something that's caused that or some sort of a pollutant, but it's actually this organism, Chlamydomonas nivalis, which is a Chlamydomonas like these that has accessory red pigments and uh, which is what we call cryophilic. It loves exceedingly cold water, so it lives in the snow melt from the snow there. So there's a huge ecological range in these things, uh, across the green algae, that is. OK, so before going into the origin of land plants, I just want to talk briefly about this uh, major type of life cycle that has a nice representative in these guys the ovas, the sea lettuces. And it's also the type of life cycle we see in all the land plants, every one. But it's been independently evolved in those two groups, as I'll point out in a minute. But, I, but ova shows this type of life cycle well, so we'll talk about, the, talk about it in this context first. So we've already talked about a gametic life cycle where the gamete is the only haploid stage, like, we, like in the case of us and the diatoms. And we talked about a zygotic life cycle, as in the fungi, where the zygote is the only diploid phase, the only diploid stage. So in those two cases, mitosis is only occurring in one of the two stages. Whereas in an alternation of generations, we have mitosis occurring in both the haploid stage and the diploid stage. And that, that results in separate multicellular organisms that are haploid and that are diploid in the same species. And these different multicellular organisms, haploid and diploid, are alternating generation after generation. So this is kind of a bizarre concept that you would actually have two different kinds of organisms in the same species that differ in their ploidy and their chromosome number. And uh, one of them, the gametophyte, uh, which is the haploid organism. Phyte literally means plant. Gametophyte refers to the gamete producing plant. Okay, and since this is a haploid organism, gametophytes are always haploid. That means they're going to be producing their gametes by mitosis, not meiosis like in us. 
So we produce our gametes by meiosis. Remember, gametes are haploid. We're diploid. We have to produce our gametes by meiosis, which results in a reduction in the chromosome, con in the, you know, the having of the genome content. But gametophytes are already haploid. They, they uh, germinate directly from spores, haploid spores. And so mitosis produce, produces gametes that are genetically identical to the, to the parent gametophyte. Those gametes uh, fuse, of course, like any fertilization event. And then we have a zygote, not shown here, but there'd be a zygote, of course. And then that would undergo mitosis to give rise to what's called the sporophyte, which means literally the spore-producing plant, and it's diploid. Sporophytes are always diploid. They always produce spores, not gametes. Even though they're diploid, they don't produce gametes, they produce spores by meiosis. So the important thing to not get confused about here, um, you know, we think of ourselves as diploid organisms undergo meiosis to produce gametes. That's not what happens in land plants or in some of the green algae. Meiosis gives rise to spores. And remember, spores, unlike gametes, they don't fuse together with one another. They just germinate to produce a new organism, which, of course, would be haploid after meiosis. So that's the life cycle. We have this multicellular organism uh, that's haploid, as well as the multicellular organism that's diploid. Are there any questions about that? Okay, let's look at an example now with ulva. Just, oh, sorry. Exactly, it's exactly the same as fertilization. If I didn't actually make this slide, it's from your book, but if I'd written it, I would have written fertilization there because everybody knows that term. But syn gamete just means fusion of gametes. Syn just means fusion or fuse. And uh, gamete is, refers to gametes. They're identical. They're synonymous terms. Well, th yeah, good point. This, this life cycle in its essence right here, this particular slide um, is really an important one because this really boils it down to, its, to, the, to the essence of what the alternation of generations is. Um, the only thing that's not shown here that really should have been included was the zygote after syngamy, but you know, I think just remember that after fertilization you get a zygote here. But um, this is the life cycle we're going to be seeing the rest of the semester. And it has various um, embellishments in different groups. And so it's a really important to get this down ASAP after the exam tonight. Um, of course, I'm not going to, you know, not, probably don't want to cloud your mind with it right now. But uh, after the exam, you know, really get this down because, I mean, in, in terms of these major components, because this is what we're going to be looking at from now on, okay? So I just can't emphasize enough how important this is. And the reason I want to show you an example in the sea lettuce, ulva, is because this is one of the simplest alternation generations that there is. It's essentially exactly like that other slide I just showed you. And why I say it's simple is because it's what we call an iso this term isn't important, but what's what we, call, what we call an isomorphic alternation of generations, where the sporophyte and the gametophyte look identical. Isomorphic, iso means the same morphic, the same morphology for both the sporophyte and the gametophyte. So we have the sporophyte here giving rise through meiosis to zoospores. These are actually motile spores, but they don't fuse together. They're not gametes. They just undergo mitoses and end up developing into a haploid gametophyte. The haploid gametophyte produces haploid gametes by mitosis. These are genetically identical to the haploid gametophyte. And then they fuse together to produce a zygote. And that zygote then, after mitosis and development, becomes the diploid sporophyte. So the only way to really tell these apart is if you did a chromosome count. And you could see that this has twice as many chromosomes as this does, these two generations. Um, also, if you looked at their reproductive structures, this is producing sporangia which are hollow sacs that produce 
uh, spores by definition. And this, the gametophyte produces gametangia, which are basically hollow sacs that produce gametes. Um, so that's the real difference, but uh, there's not a whole lot to go on there. So this is a really beautiful case of, a, of an alternation of generations where the two phases of the life cycle, we call it the diptych, the uh, sporophyte or diploid phase and the gametophyte or haploid phase are, are very, very similar. Yeah, these are free living from one another, but that's a really good point because we'll see later in the land plants that it's often the case that the gametophyte or the sporophyte is dependent on, on its immediate parent. So we'll see parasitism by one generation on another generation in a lot of cases. Okay, so as far as economic importance of algae, I've already mentioned diatoms and diatomaceous earth. But there's some really important compounds that are harvested from brown algae and red algae in particular. And I thought they were worth mentioning. I uh, already mentioned, well, there are a large number of different red and brown algae that are harvested as edible seaweeds used extensively in Asian cuisine. We can't really act, we can't digest those carbohydrates, uh, but they're a good source of minerals, roughage, et cetera. And also, this is a red alga, actually, nori, the one you're probably the most familiar with. But there are browns as well that are used in um, Japanese cuisine, for example. Uh, another so, uh, compound uh, harvested from red alga is auger. And auger, of course, is used for, bacteria, for microbial culturing in petri dishes. You know, this is our typical um, culturing medium in scientific studies of microbes and molecular biology. And agarose, the refined product there, is used in electrophoresis. So if you're trying to separate, separate out DNA molecules of different sizes, um, agarose is generally the medium that's used for gel electrophoresis um, uh, for um, large fragments, not in DNA sequencing where we use acrylamide, but for, um, for larger fragments, agarose is often used. So these, for micro microbiology and molecular biology, Red algae have proven to be really important. And then the brown algae are sources of things like uh, polysaccharides, these mucilaginous polysaccharides like carrageenan and alginate that um, are used as thickening agents or emulsifying agents in a wide variety of different kinds of drinks and foods. Uh, you're constantly ingesting alginate and carrageenan in processed foods. It's included in, in all kinds of things. I mean, even in beer, to stabilize the head of beers, and a lot of beers, alginate is used. Um, it's put in ice cream to keep it from melting as quickly as it would otherwise. I mean, there's a lot of uses that, you, that, you, that uh, span much of what we take for granted in our food that comes from brown algae. And here you can see an example in the medical profession of alginate being used as the main medium for dental impressions. So th these are really important uh, substances that are used in a lot of different ways. OK, so now we're going to get into the origin of land plants. And this segues directly from algae, because the green algae, as you can see from this tree here, here are the land plants. The green algae are a paraphyletic group. So the green algae don't form a clade by themselves. Some green algae, example shown here, are more closely related to land plants than they are to other green algae. So the sea lettuce and some of these marine algae, or the marine algae in general, are pretty distantly related to land plants. And um, the closest relatives of land plants turn out to be freshwater algae, freshwater green algae. So the most important points from these results, which come both from morphological data, mostly ultrastructural characters, really you can't see with your naked eye, um, and molecular data, is that the land plants evolved from freshwater habitats 
So this conception of plants having invaded land from the ocean is misconstrued based on at least the modern diversity. All of the green algae that we know of that fall out in this clade that's sister to the land plants um, occur in fresh water. So the ancestor of land plants had to first invade fresh water in the continental setting and then from there they invaded uh, terrestrial habitats. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's, that sort of transition would, 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 would make uh, ecological sense. And this is something that's pretty now well established. Um, now that the molecular data is available, people have gone in and looked at the morphology more closely. And there's a whole list of features that are in your textbook. You can look, at, uh, up, look it up if you'd like. Um, one of the most interesting ones, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment actually. But anyways, the thing that's come out of this is that we really can't have a phylum called green algae. You know, the, uh, it doesn't, doesn't work since they're paraphyletic. Uh, the land plants appear to be monophyletic. And these freshwater green algae that are close relatives are monophyletic. These taken together are a monophyletic group, sometimes called this, the uh, streptophytes. And um, all of the green plants, all the green organisms now, are often referred to by botanists as the green plants. So the green algae plus the land plants together, they make up one big monophyletic group of, of green organisms. And that's um, what you'll often see referred to as the green plants or Virta planti. OK, so there are questions about that? So here's what one of those, oh, sorry. So here we go to onto land. And um, here's one of those freshwater green algae. Uh, this is the genus Cara that the, the phylum is named for, uh, the caraphytes that are the closest relatives of land plants like mosses. Again, freshwater. These have a life cycle that is not an alternation of generations. These caraphytes, the only diploid stage in these caraphytes is the zygote. So they're more like fungi in that sense. They um, undergo uh, meiosis immediately after fertilization. So the alternation of generations was not present in the, close, in, in the aquatic ancestors of land plants, but it's something that appears to have evolved um, subsequently. But we have an alternation of generations in all the land plants like the mosses. OK, so that's, that's an important point to consider. And these caraphytes uh, include unicellular as well as multicellular things like this. So the multicellular condition may be independently derived as well in the land plants. Go back. Uh, the alternation generations that we see in something like ulva, the sea lettuce, uh, probably evolved separately. So the alternation generations we see in land plants is probably of separate origin. And you can see it, we'll, I'll show you as we go through here that we have a really nice progression in the evolution of the sporophyte generation. So basically the, the main adult body of a caraphyte was haploid. And what we see in the mosses and the other plants we call bryophytes, which are this part of the tree of land plants. These are all the land plants here. The bryophytes here, their main, reper their main vegetative body that's photosynthetic, or the main photosynthesis at least that goes on in them, is the gametophyte, is the haploid generation. And the diploid phase, is, is very reduced, it's, or I shouldn't say it's reduced, it's very small. These things probably, are, the land plants pro evolved from an ancestor that probably lacked any uh, sporophyte phase, a diploid phase. And so we see very, uh, very small little sporophytes in these. And what we'll see as we go through here is that the sporophyte gets progressively more complex and important in the life cycle. That's a theme in the land plants, that we start out with the gametophyte, the haploid generation being dominant, and eventually the diploid sporophyte generation becomes dominant in the, land, in the vascular plants, which are the, the plants that we see mostly around us that have 
that are big and have major conducting tissue. So the bryophytes include the mosses, the hornworts, and the liverworts. And the ending wart, W-R-T, just means herb. It doesn't mean some sort of, uh, some sort of, you know, little carbuncle or something on these things. These things have, uh, wart is just an old English term for, uh, for an herb as opposed to a woody plant. Okay, so there are three major groups of bryophytes, as they're called. And the bryophytes appear to be paraphyletic. We were just seeing how the green algae look paraphyletic relative to the land plants. The bryophytes are paraphyletic relative to the vascular plants. Okay, the vascular plants include the ferns, the all the seed plants, um, the club mosses and spike mosses and quill warts. These are basically all the really conspicuous plants that you see out in the environment. And the mosses, the hornworts, and liverworts are very small plants. They rarely get over 15 centimeters in height, you know, something like that. And that's because they don't have the sort of uh, highly reinforced conducting tissue that allows them to attain large sizes. But um, there, are, anyways, there are three distinct groups that had already started to diversify into these major lineages before the vascular plants originated. And we could really say, essentially, that the bryophytes gave rise to the vascular plants, these larger plants that have conducting tissue, given that they constitute a grade or a paraphyletic group within which the vascular plants are nested. Are there questions about that? Yeah, Brad? Yeah, the... Um, the liverworts, I should say, the, the mosses actually do have some conducting tissue, and they're the only members of this group that can get fairly sizable. There are, in fact, some mosses that can get up to a couple meters in height. And they have what are called leptoids and hydroids. That's not important, but they have some conducting cells that move around water as well as nutrients in their tissues. But it isn't reinforced by lignin, which is the case in that was what we see in the vascular tissue of vascular plants. And lignin imparts great strength to the conducting tissue, in particular to the xylem, the water conducting tissue, and allows vascular plants to get to be large branched sporophytes, to have large branched sporophytes. Um, hornworts and liverworts uh, don't have those leptoids and hydroids, and they're pretty much, as I'll show you here, uh, well, let's go to the life cycle first of bryophytes to make this point. And I am not so sure I'm gonna be able to get through the life cycle of bryophytes in three minutes or two minutes. Um, but I just wanna make the point first, and we'll get back to this next time, that as I was saying, the, uh, the neophyte, the haploid phase of bryophytes is the green photosynthetic dominant phase. And you can see a typical uh, moss to metophyte right here. And again, it's germinating from spores. It has, a, it has a filamentous form early in its development and then gets to be more of a leafy like, has a, looks like a leafy stem. But this is a gametophyte, not a sporophyte. So the, the structures that look like leaves are not truly homologous to the leaves we see in land plants that are in the sporophyte generation. Um, but in any case, this is a gametophyte and then it produces um, gametangia up in the tips here. Uh, the, and we'll get to those gametangia later. But uh, basically the sporophyte is just this structure here. It's parasitic on the gametophyte. It grows out of it. And it's pretty much just a sporangium on a stalk. So we have a highly reduced, or I should say a small sporophyte where we have um, meiosis giving rise to spores. So uh, this is just an intro to the bryophyte life cycle. We'll talk more about it next time. So remember to set your clock, clocks back again. And uh, good luck on the exam tonight.